This morning, uh, I want you to take out your worship guide, and I want to uh, use an introduction that uh, was never meant to be used. Uh, somehow, in the translation of a hurried moment at the end of the week, uh, as I gave the title of today's message, The Birth, uh, which is the first in a series of eight that I will preach and one that Brother Lindsay will preach, which is nine different uh, occurrences in the life and ministry of Jesus from his birth to his resurrection. And all of this is purposed in the fact that we are preparing ourselves for the celebration of Easter and its resurrection. And so uh, that's what the series is about. But on Sunday night, we're doing a study on Revelation, the letters to the seven churches. Now, uh, I, there's two things here. We're not going past the third chapter, okay? Understand that. And understand that even though we've had two weeks to do some introduction and talk about different things to understand views and things of that nature like the four interpretive views, the four millennial views, the four visions, all those fun things that you kind of need in front of you when you begin to open the book. The first lesson in the text is tonight, and it's about the first vision, and it's the vision of the Son of Man, which John lays out for us, and every single characteristic of the Son of Man is uniquely found in the message in one of the letters to one of the churches. And so we're going to look at that tonight. So we have that introduction as we move into those seven lessons. And it's called the first vision. And so as I was trying to encourage uh, my administrative assistant to be sure it got into the worship guide, she must have thought I wanted it on this. And so the vision and an introduction to the gospel, neither one of those are a part of today's message. But they are a good invitation to tonight's study. And uh, I was off to uh, Elba. How many of y'all know the big city of Elba? Yeah. Uh, we had a deacon here, uh, was here with us to about uh, 2002, 2003, and work took him back to Elba. He has had a long, hard physical battle, and he went to be with the Lord. His name's Eddie Vaughn, and Eddie and Melinda raised their children here in our church, and uh, they called and asked me to uh, be the major presenter uh, at that funeral. And uh, the funeral was three hours long. And uh, you say, well, Pastor, no, I did not do that. But there were at least, and this is on the conservative side, at least 1,500 people that came and she hugged every one of them. Even though she was in excruciating pain from a surgery she was supposed to have last week to her back. So you pray for the Vaughn family. You pray for that community. He was the voice of the Elba Tigers. He announced their games. Everybody there loved him, and you can tell by that kind of... When's the last time you went to a funeral and 1,500 people showed up? Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I thought to myself, what a blessing. Here's somebody that God has mightily used, born and raised in his community, has an influence on the lives of many, many people. Uh, they knew of his love for his wife, his love for his kids his love for his community, his love for his church, but most of all, his love for his Lord. And uh, so uh, we are somewhat a part of that. So uh, we want to bring that up, and that's what had me off in a hurry and brought us to this. So let's go to the lesson for today, the birth. Now you might say, Pastor, <laughs> oh my goodness, we just got through with Christmas. You know, we're barely out of that time of the year, and... Uh, that's a good, good response, you know, but I have found that most of us, both as pastors and as those participating in looking at the materials, we confine ourselves to the synoptics. And actually, there's only two of those, of the three that are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that give us birth narrative. And the primary form of 
the birth of Jesus is in that narrative form, and that's what we celebrate when we go to the nativity scene, you know, with the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the sheep and the little drummer boy and all that stuff. I hope you don't put the little drummer boy in your nativity scene. And I hope you know that the wise man didn't show up to about a year later. Some of those things you do need to know, although you, you only have one shot to represent it, so put it in there. And, uh, but, you know, I thought we needed to kind of uh, back up. You ever notice when you back up and you, you keep backing up, you get a broader and broader view? Maybe like how you feel when you go down and you look out across the vastness of the gulf. Or maybe when you go to the mountains and you have that, what we call a bird's eye view of things. Doesn't it just do something to you. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what it is about the mountains that make people desire to worship, but it does. And when they're in the vastness of the sea, they just love the water. They, they can't really tell you why. In fact, a lot of you moved here and live here because of that water, uh, though we can't fully explain it. But I think it tells us something about God. And so what I want us to do is to look at the birth as we begin in the first epic of the life of a journey through the life of Christ. That's what I want you to do with us, is to go with us on a journey through the life of Christ. And let's begin with his birth, but let's look at it theologically. Now, I know somebody's saying, what? What? Theology. I didn't come to hear theology. Well, good. Let's, let's hear scripture, okay? Read with me in John 1, verse 1. In the beginning, what do you think of? You know what John wanted you to think of? Genesis. You know what he wants you to compare this to? Genesis. Before time ever began, in the beginning. Now, that's pretty awesome. But what he says after that even makes more sense about Jesus and his birth. In the beginning was the Word. Now, that is a misunderstood concept. Let me call it that first. But the word, word, is the word logos. And the prominent worldview of the first century was Stoicism, and the central tenet of their belief was the divine Logos. They said as they backed up, and they looked at the world around them, and they looked at the skies above them, and they looked at everything that they could observe, that there was something in all of that that made sense. And to give it a definition, they called it the Logos, from which we get our word, word. So when you read this, what John's really saying, he's saying is in the beginning was that which makes life make sense. Now how many of you want your life to make sense? And do you know that you can understand sensibleness by just looking at the birth of the incarnate word? As we read through this text, and it says in the beginning was the Word, it says the Word was with God, and the Word, don't let anybody ever change that verb. The Word was God. That means He's eternal. That means He's a part of the Trinity. In fact, it's going to go on to say some very powerful things, but before we get too far down the road, I want to deal with the word, word. If I ask most of you, do you have a Bible today? Would you lift it up and just show me your Bible, if you've got a Bible? It's, look at all of them. Bibles. Now, I, I want to tell all of you who don't have a Bible today that are using your phone, hold your phone up. Anybody using their phone? Yeah, look at that, look at that, look at that. Okay, now... The difference between you that have a Bible and those that have cell phones, they have a bunch of Bibles. You see, now preachers know they check on you. 
You know, they could just hit a button and jump from passage to passage to passage. He said, you know, I know where he got that. Well, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use every available resource. Uh, but when we talk about God's Word, and we talk about Jesus and his birth, and we look at the theology of it, what we're looking at is God was behind the sensibleness of life for you and me from all eternity. And as one of the great reformers, Martin Luther, he said, actually, when you say the word of God, you're actually saying four things. And I want you to listen to these. These are this is what they call the fourfold understanding of the word of God. First of all, the word of God is the heart and being of God himself. Listen, God makes sense. And everywhere you go, and every person or people that you see that disavows that God is, they don't make sense. God is the very foundation of sensibleness. And so the very heart and being of God himself is the Word. But then it says in verse 14, is one of our passages for today, and that is, is that the Word became flesh. And so the historical Jesus was the living, breathing, historical word of God. And everything Jesus said and did, what? Made life make sense. And then it says that after Jesus departed this planet, that men and women before this book was penned went about and proclaimed the word of of God. That is the truth of God being activated by the Spirit of God coming into the hearts of men and women and convincing them of sin and righteousness and judgment. Do you remember when you were saved and you heard God speak to your heart in life and nobody had to say, hey, this is God. You knew it was God. And you knew he was right. And you knew you were wrong. And you said, Lord, forgive me. As would you come in and forgive me of my sin? You knew you were the I in the middle of that word, and you knew that everything that you did under your own control is a mess. And you need that mess straightened out. And so they preach. In fact, it still happens today. If you're here and you're a pastor, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You prepare a message, you take it out of this written word, and you speak it as a living word, but what really makes the sermon alive is what God does with it when it gets inside of your heart. And I want to let you know a secret. How many preachers have got in here today? One, two, three, four. Wait till you're standing up here preaching your own sermon and God gets a hold of your heart. You thought it was yours. But it's always, if it's anything worthwhile, his. So people come out, oh, pastor, you did I said, listen, if, if, if something good came out of this, <laughs> that belongs to God. He's the one that does that. So the fourth understanding is that holy men, moved by the Spirit of God, sit down to write the Word of God. And that's the book or the data on your screens that you have printed. So there's a fourfold understanding of the Word of God. So when we first come to understand the birth of Jesus, and we're looking at it through the lens of what I call theology, then I want to first encourage you to know that it is an answer to prophecy. Now, I got to thinking, where do you go to get this, this, this view where you back up and you, you get it all... You know, I was like, well, probably the book of Genesis, right? Or somewhere back there. Uh, no. I, I want us to go to the first verse. I didn't write it down because I didn't want you to answer my question right. Go with me to the book of Revelation. Please, no, that word does not have an S on the end of it. It is the book of Revelation, not Revelations. It is the vision given by God to John who penned it and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit preserved it for us. 
But in the book of Revelation, in chapter 13, it's spooky, it's scary. It may have 666 somewhere around it. It's this part about the beast. But what I want you to see is what it says when it's speaking about the beast. In verse 8, at the end of that verse, it says, The Lamb, the Lamb who was slain before the foundation, before the pillars of the existence of this planet were ever laid. the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So, who is being birthed? Oh, I know. I know the track of the cradle of civilization and how a Semite came and found a covenant with God, and that covenant led its way all the way to that right moment, as Paul said, when in the fullness of time, the Christ was born. I know that the Phoenicians affected trade. I know that the diaspora of the Jews set up preaching stations. I know that culture and language was affected by Alexander the Great. I know all of that stuff was done. So in the right moment when Jesus was born, historically it happened, but my friend, it was an eternal matter way before it became a history matter. Amen. And when you look at the birth of Christ, you need to know that. You need to know it is theological. It's eternal. And John says, guys, when you look at Jesus and you look straight into his heart, you need to see these things because it'll help your life make sense. So the first prophecy is the prophecy of blessing. In Brittany, it is found in Genesis. She's our resident scholar in Genesis right now. You know what that means? That's the person who's spending the most time studying that book. I thought y'all would think that was funny. Nobody thought that was funny. But in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, the Lord, and the word there is the covenant God, we would say Yahweh, uh, maybe you would say Jehovah, which is a uh, kind of a transliteration, changing the sounds of vowels and words so that you go from a Y to a J and you get Jehovah instead of Yahweh. So you need to know the Tetragrammaton and you need to understand what that is or you won't be able to talk to those folks who call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, but Yahweh is a word that was not spoken and the letters and vowels from Adonai and Elohim are inserted to give us what we call Jehovah. And so the covenant God, Yahweh had said to Abram, which means this is before the supernatural miracle of the birth of Isaac. I mean, of, yeah, of Isaac comes. He's still Abram, not the father of many nations. It says, he said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed, what? Through you. That is a prophecy in the midst of a covenant promise that is fulfilled when Jesus Christ became flesh on this planet. That's why we call it the Incarnation. Don't let your ears do tricks. It is not reincarnation. That's something else. This is incarnation. But the prophecy is that the birth of Christ was a blessing. But it was a blessing bought in the very blood of God. Go with me to the next text in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot with a blazing torch 
appeared and passed between the pieces. Now, it seems kind of odd to us, and really was odd to me. It took me a long time to get my hands around this. But you can go ahead and you can pull that verse up, and you can check it in all your commentaries and run it down. Uh, first time I ever saw it was when I went into the Church of All Nations on the Mount of Olives, and the guy came in, and he's swinging this thing on a chain, and it's sin sense and smoke coming out of it. And I, uh, I'm, I'm seriously, my wife would not be able to worship in this church because I went in, and the whole place is smoky. And there's candles and incense. It's all this stuff. Oh, but, you know, God wants us to experience him in every single sense we have. He wants us to hear him. He wants us to see him. He wants us to smell him. He wants us to feel him. There's not a single perceptor in your existence that God does not want to communicate to you through. And friend, everything he has to say, what? Y'all ain't got it yet? Make sense! Come on now, you're not that slow. The word makes life make sense. Yes. Well, this story, which I give most of its credit and its understanding on my part to Brother Rudy, who really likes to dig behind things, what happened is Abraham cut all these animals up and put their parts away, and then these birds were coming. You remember he kept trying to run the birds off. Well, the birds represented other nations. And he's concerned about the sacrifice and God's relationship with just the covenant people. And so he did it as long as he could, and finally a deep sleep falls on Abraham, and while he's asleep, God shows up as a flesh pot, and he passes through the sacrifice. For you see, a covenant's cut between two people, and they make an agreement. And what God was saying to us, in my language, is Abraham, if you fail to keep the covenant, I will spill my blood to make it good. But you see, God had already decided that. Back up, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And what would be the announcement at his baptism? Behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And the theological understanding of the birth of Jesus is of utmost importance. And you need to understand it and you need to know that it answers every single prophecy. It was the blessing through Abraham. It was the blood that God took upon himself to shed for the forgiveness of our sin, and it is the blessed hope. In Isaiah 53, and we know that passage, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of God been revealed? He's talking about the covenant to Israel. But then you get over in the book of Hebrews and you look at chapter 6 and verse 13 through 20. It is us who have that promise. The ones who were afar off called under what? The blood of the Lamb. My oh, friend, I want you to know today that the birth of Jesus is prophetically sound. God fulfilled Old Testament prophecy in the Christ or if you want to be Jewish in the Messiah so not only is there prophecy here there's divinity here we move into the statement going back to our text I encourage you to go back to John here The Word was God. Not a God. The Word was God. Behold, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and him only shall you serve. There is no division in God. Though we see him as Holy Trinity, he is still one in three persons. He's Father, he's Son, he's Spirit. Do you say that? Did you grow up saying that? We believe in God the Father, we believe in God the Son, 
and we believe in God, and you may have been so old you said Holy Ghost. And now we say we believe in God the Spirit. What are we doing? We're announcing that we believe in the eternal unity of the one and only God. He is person. And Jesus is that person. But notice what the uniqueness of the person of Christ is. According to John, he says, Through him all things were made. And without him was nothing made that has been made. And in him is life, and the life is the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness literally cannot snuff it out. Listen, when God created this world, it was Jesus who laid its foundations. It was Jesus who was the light that penetrated the darkness and put out the chaos and brought in the orderly cosmos. It was Jesus who created everything and everybody, and it's Jesus and Jesus alone that will make your life and my life make sense because he's the master designer. And if you want to know where to go to get your help when your life's in a mess, go to the person who made you, who created you, who understands how and why you should function. He is the creator. But just in case you might think, he doesn't understand. He became one of us. The Word, chapter 14, I mean verse 14 of chapter 1, the Word became flesh, made his dwelling. No, we just, we just dress words up. That means he tabernacled with us. How many of you have enough Old Testament to remember about the tabernacle? That was prior to the temple and after the tents of meeting. But you've got to keep backing up because, you see, you can't get really what's about the tabernacle if you don't go all the way back to God fulfilling his promise through, where did we start? Abraham. And Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had Joseph, got him down there, stayed 400 and... Uh, some odd years, to the day, I should remember. I think it's 443 or 434, something like that. I have all my facts down this morning. <laughs> Quoted it perfect in Sunday school, but it just isn't there right now. Uh, but at the end of that time, God sent another fellow. He's out on the other side of the desert tending the sheep. His name was Moses. You remember that? 400 years later, Moses comes. And when they leave after that tenth plague, which was the death of the firstborn, but in Israel it was the death of the lamb, that their blood on the doorpost and the lintel made the death angel pass over. And when that occurred, God, in a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, put his... Shekinah cloud of glory. His presence in their midst. And everywhere they went, they followed that cloud. About 30 days out, it came and it rested on Mount Sinai. And when it rested on Mount Sinai, God called Moses up. We know all that stories. Every one of us has seen Charlton Heston do this. <laughs> but at the end of it, you got a set of tablets... You've got a foundation for society and you've got a group of people that are starting fresh. They don't know how to be their own. They don't know how to govern their own. You know, every time I get to thinking about how things are displeasing to me as a pastor, I go back and I read about Moses. I mean, about every 30 days to two months, they're trying to stone him. He's the guy that brought him out of Egypt. And you're saying, What? You know, it, it, we're just that kind of folk. And God knows he's got to change us from the inside out. And so God being, brings them out of Egypt and they go and they get the, the, the law on Mount Sinai and then God has them develop this thing called the 
tabernacle and in the very holy of holiest places in the tabernacle is a place where there is a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And there on the top of the Ark of the Covenant are the wings of the cherubs. And underneath the wings of the cherubs is a place called the mercy seat. And between the mercy seat and the wings of the cherub, God's Shekinah cloud of glory comes and abides right there underneath the wings. So once a year, when on the Day of Atonement the blood is shed and sprinkled, the sins can be covered. Oh, friends, I want to tell you, it gets a whole lot better. It gets a whole lot better because when that perfect lamb, that lamb slain before the foundation of the world, that lamb that is the very word of God, when that lamb was dying on Calvary's tree and he said, to Telestai, paid it full. He didn't cover your sins. He washed them away. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other. Huh? Then I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. My friend, it is amazing grace. And we beheld him as the only son of the Father, full. There's nothing left to put there. He is the one and only, full of grace, God's unmerited favor. And you will never come to truth if you don't come by way of grace. Full of grace and truth. What am I trying to say to you today? When you look at the birth of Jesus, it is eternal. We can walk through the historical narrative. We can look at all the things that are as majestic as they are. But it's always been God's desire to make your life and mine make sense. He came. He lived, he died, he rose again. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He poured the Holy Spirit out on the church. And he lets you and I choose. So how will you choose today when the sensibleness of God speaks to your heart this morning? Will you receive him and make him Lord of your life? Will you say, Father, come. Make sense of things for me. And I do want to say, not in fear, not in manipulation of emotion, one day he's going to come and he's going to hold each one of us accountable for how we choose.